Thank you for um, signing up to the webinar today. Um, this is part of the Meet the Buyer um, London Growth Programme. Um, Alison Louis here today to talk about how to, to pitch and sell into fashion buyers. Um, there's a question box um, on the side. So if you have any questions that you'd like me to ask Alison at the end, please do jot them in there. Um, just a friendly reminder as well that we have the uh, Christmas networking drinks tonight. Um, I think I sent an email to everybody about details about that, so please do sign up to that if you haven't already done that. Um, but without any further ado, hand it over to Alison, who's going to talk about uh, pitching to buyers. Hi, thanks Bailey. Hi everybody. Um, welcome to the pitching to buyers session. Uh, this session is run for about half an hour, uh, and then as Barry said, there'll be an opportunity to send in some questions, which hopefully I'll be able to answer. Um, so uh, just a little bit about my background. Um, I sort of have always worked within the fashion industry and spent over 15 years really running my own label. I was the director of a large company, uh, then I had a label um, under my own name and then various other labels. So that's all I really know. Um, and while I was sort of running my own label, I did have um, a lot of external work and I was a consultant with luxury designers such as Matthew Williamson uh, and Preen and a lot of the sort of designers that were at the time showing at London Fashion Week and that gave me an insight into the sort of luxury end of the market because my brands were very much sort of middle to top end and the real sort of luxury designer end is quite different. Um, then I was merrily working away doing that and um, I was asked to get involved with the Fashion and Textile Museum in London Bridge. Um, at the time it was taken over from Zander Roads by Newham College. And while running the museum, um, that's where I got interested in the kind of business support side of things because I set up a shop in the museum to showcase designers' uh, work and it became quite apparent to me that um, a lot of creative people had lots of good ideas, but they found it difficult with the business side and to actually turn that into a, a viable business. So um, I was also asked to write a, a book at about that same time um, called Design Create Sell. And that was sort of a very sort of easy step by step guide to starting and running a fashion business. It's not an academic book. Um, but then I was getting very good feedback to that. And so basically as a legacy of one of the programs we were running through the museum, I left and set up Fashion Angel. And basically what we do at Fashion Angel is um, we offer sector specific business support, uh, primarily to fashion businesses and fashion brands. So the core of what we do is one-to-one -one business mentoring for a new business that might be helping them develop their strategy at the beginning and looking at sourcing and production and marketing and different sales channels and also the finance aspect but also we work with more established businesses that are looking to take the business to the next level and grow it um, so we might be helping with that and maybe preparing for investment we do workshops every month um, at the British Library um, on a bowling sort of topic um, so it could be sourcing and production it could be pitching to buyers like this one it could be crowdfunding um, selling fashion online um, and every month we do a different one and we also do sort of wider networking events um, which is an opportunity for us to bring in other industry speakers and get our community kind of networking with each other so they can all collaborate um, also that works into the business club we've got an online business club again which is very much about sharing resources and collaborating um, amongst designers and then for those looking for funding um, we are a delivery partner for the government startup loan scheme which is primarily for businesses trading under two years um, and you can borrow anything from 1,000 to 25,000 um, pounds but it's a good scheme because it's quite flexible and if you get the loan approved it comes with business mentoring with us as well and we're the only partner that just focuses on the fashion industry and then for businesses that have been trading um, invariably you're going to need more money to grow get to the next stage then we are also starting to help businesses look at what the funding outlook is and where they can access uh, investment for growth as well so that's that's kind of us so we I said we're talking mainly about pitching to retail buyers and um, there's a couple of things that you need to have really in place before you sort of start going down this route um, you need to have 
a very clear and consistent digital brand identity before you start approaching buyers. Um, because there's a lot of competition out there and it's got to be very, very clear um, and, and really stand out. And you have to be, keep reinforcing the messaging. Use a clear brand backstory because that is really what helps you create an emotional attachment with your customers and then hopefully um, build customer loyalty. And now it's not just about selling products, really. It is about that story um, which brings in all your sort of core values and ethos of the brand into it. And you need to have always ready a kind of a very um, snappy USP. Um, that's a unique selling proposition. But basically, this is your kind of statement, 10, 12 words that really highlight the points that make your brand unique. Um, and that is sort of the basis of an elevator pitch, should you have to pitch to investors, but also if you're meeting buyers or anybody really, you need to have a quick statement and they immediately understand what it is you're offering. So those things need to be in place before you actually reach out. And there's a, a, a couple of examples of brands that we work with um, that have done this quite well. Um, We've got um, Solace London is a brand that we work with, and um, they really, within a space of less than three years, have built a massive business that sells a huge amount, um, both through their own e-commerce, but also they're in over 100 global stores um, and all the primary retailers. So their sort of USP is modern futurism balanced with timeless minimalism. And anyone that knows their products um, will understand that that, uh, that really sums it up pretty well. Uh, another brand that we work with, uh, Rixo, um, they, again, didn't start that long ago, um, a design duo, and it was always been focused on their kind of original hand-painted prints. And it started off with um, dresses, um, and now the range has expanded to lots of different product categories. They primarily started business to consumer, but then once they built their buzz, they're a good kind of example of how then now they have moved into wholesale and supply retailers. And their kind of USP was that they had these unique prints, but they were great silhouettes, shapes that would flatter everybody and everyone anytime. Um, and that has really served them pretty well. Um, another brand we work with, something a bit different, uh, the London Sock Company. They've got very strong visual branding, so I do recommend you sort of go onto their website. But very simple, they use USP. Better socks, direct to your door. And they started off selling as a subscription service, um, but then they moved into just, you know, you can have a subscription, but you can just buy the products online. But now they have again moved into wholesale and are stopped by sort of major retailers. And a very simple proposition but it's worked well and they've um, certainly achieved investment to uh, expand their business. So if you're going to wholesale, um, you've got a few options about how you're gonna tackle this. So firstly, it might be that you're gonna manage the sales in house. And actually I think when you're starting uh, on wholesale, it's quite a good idea to do that because if you start to meet with buyers yourself, you're kind of gonna get a sense of what they like, what they don't like, and actually start to build up those relationships. And at the end of the day, relationships are really important. But at a certain point, um, even if you're starting doing the sales yourself, if you're going to grow the business, you're going to have to get um, ex some external help. And some people choose to work with a sales agency. And a sales agency basically will have samples of your collection of products, and they will be showing those to retail buyers and taking orders on your behalf, or hopefully they will. Um, they do that um, for usually a commission on the sales that they take, uh, and sometimes they also charge a showroom fee um, for the sort of selling period time. And certainly that can work well if you are planning to sell uh, nationally or internationally. And there are certain countries that much prefer to work with local sales agents than with a brand uh, that's situated in another territory. Um, Italy is a good example of that, German is also a good example, and Japan. So in many ways, they prefer to work with that intermediary. Another option is that you take a stand at a trade show. Um, now, there are many trade shows, uh, both in the UK and internationally, and it's important to get the right trade shows for your particular product and market. Um, but that would give you exposure 
to lots of brands as well as potentially to press and also agents. Uh, when I found our sales agents, it was usually through showing uh, at trade shows. However, trade shows are expensive. And I would say that attendance trade shows has been going gradually down and down because uh, buyers have less, bu less budgets uh, to play with. And it's quite a long term investment because a lot of uh, buyers, they like to see you for a few seasons before they'll take that risk placing an order with you. So you may have to show at least two or three times before you get any orders. Um, and you have to be prepared for that if you're going to go down that road. Another option is to be represented by a showroom during the selling season. So showrooms tend to be like a, a retail pop-up, but in fact, it's just for the trade. And you will have um, people that organize the showrooms represent several brands during a selling period for a few days. And that would be maybe to coincide with the fashion weeks or, or when the other collections are being sold. And the advantage of that is that if the showroom is representing other complementary brands to yours and, and are selling to the kind of retailers that you want to sell to, then they can fast track that for you. And while the buyers are making appointments to see um, the other brands, they can also take a look at your brand. And in some ways, a lot of people are starting to prefer showing with a showroom rather than taking a stand at a trade show. And lastly, um, another option is working with a distributor. Uh, a distributor works differently to a sales agency because basically they are your customer. They are buying all the stock from you or placing orders with you to be made. And then they are responsible for distributing it to whoever they've taken orders from on the sales side uh, and also collecting all the money. Um, and so it's really just you dealing with them. And that could make your life a lot easier. The thing to think about with a distributor is firstly, for them to take on that sort of level of responsibility means it has to be financially worthwhile for them. So often, you know, the margins aren't there to work with distributor. You have to really think about that carefully. The other thing that can happen is that you sometimes are losing control of your brand because although you will have contracts with them, um, if they are going to get left with stock, they will try and offload it. And that's why often you see um, brands not understanding why their stock is being sold in places that they didn't sell to. And it's usually because the distributor has decided to shift surplus stock. Um, and that could even be someone like eBay or at a discounter like TK Maxx. Um, and that may not be what you want for the brand. So you just have to really kind of consider that and think about that seriously. But at least there are a few options. But before you start this journey, um, What's vital is that you understand the customer um, and that goes for anything that you're selling or any service or product. Um, and it's just as important to understand the retail buyer as well as your consumer customer, because you really want to sort of know what makes them tick. So you need to think like a buyer, basically, um, and you need to really understand the buying process. and on what basis they are making their decisions. Because um, sometimes you might think, well, you've shown a buyer and they decided not to buy from you and you, you don't really understand why. So you really got to get your head inside theirs and think about what is influencing their decision making. And there'll probably be a couple of different things that are influencing them. Some are in, internal factors and some are external factors that are always going to be at the back of their mind. So. The external factors are likely to be what is happening um, in general in the sort of wholesale and retail market. When business is tough, obviously, that's going to make buyers quite cautious. Also, it depends on their business model. Are they um, a bricks and mortar store or are they an e-commerce uh, seller or perhaps they're doing both? I mean, most uh, retailers now are omnichannel or selling online and offline. And obviously, that's going to influence their buying decision, because if you're buying for a physical store, it is quite different to selling online um, because the, the sort of challenges and the parameters are different. They'll also have to take into consideration what's going on in general uh, with the wider economy and the government. And there could be sort of 
changes coming into play. And of course, we've been going through the last couple of years a very uh, tricky and uncertain time. It's only just about to get more uncertain by the sounds of it. So that, again, will affect the kind of level of risk a buyer will be prepared to take. They will also be studying market trends, um, looking to see what, what's coming in. Um, and they'll also be keeping an eye on what their competitors are up to. So there's a lot externally that they have to be thinking about. And then, uh, as well as that, they've got what's going on within the actual business they are working in. So there'll be a kind of a, a company strategy that they will have to be adhering to. Um, it might be a, a business with multiple outlets, um, both nationally and internationally. Uh, they'll obviously be c carrying certain product ranges. So when they're looking at product, you know, they'll be thinking, does this, is this fit in with what we already stock? And of course, uh, at the end of the day, they've got to always go back to what their target customer is going to want. They'll also be uh, reviewing past sales all the time um, and sort of focusing on the areas that have done well and the areas that perhaps haven't done quite so well. If it's a larger business, um, the buyer might have to answer to the board of directors and their investors. And there might be general things going on in terms of, particularly if it's a publicly listed company, um, what's going on in the city and how analysts are viewing the business. And again, that might kind of influence the kind of basic sort of company strategy going forward. And they'll also have a set budget. It's not a question of any buyer just being able to buy whatever they like. They will have a budget, whether they're a small or a big business, and have to spread that budget along all the different suppliers that they want to place orders with. So there's a lot for them to do. And what they're going to be looking for, number one, is as I said at the beginning, they're going to want that strong brand identity and, of course, a fantastic product. Uh, because they're going to already be stocking a lot of brands, uh, there has to be a clear point of difference um, that you're offering to them. And they need to really feel that the products you're offering are right for their target customer. Now, another thing that buyers do, um, and it's actually the first thing they do when they look at a new brand um, or a new stockist, they look to see what kind of online community you've got and what the engagement is. So I've worked with a lot of brands that think because they're primarily focusing on wholesale, they haven't got to put so much effort on building that online community and engaging on social media, etc. But in fact, it is just as important because for a buyer, if they know that you've got an engaged following, that will give them um, encouragement that actually you're a risk worth taking as a new brand because you've already created a buzz and people are obviously liking what you're doing. Whereas if you haven't really got any kind of presence, they've got nothing to kind of benchmark you against. So, you know, don't forget that. Um, they will also look to see that your price points uh, and your pricing structure is in line with theirs and that you really understand every bit of your business that you've kind of sorted out all the production particularly because one thing um, that buyers can be nervous about is buying a new brand in case there's going to be any issues with the quality control and that you understand their business because again it's about you giving them what they want but not what you want to give them and they'll be very keen to see that you are understanding who your brand adjacencies are and who the competition is and although, again, some brands say, oh, we haven't really got any competitors, unless you have invented something or you are patenting something um, that you've, you've developed, everybody has competition. So you have to be aware you don't exist in a bubble. You have to be aware of who those, those competitors are. So who are those competitors? Well, you need to really stalk the competition. Um, and it's not so that you're going to copy their designs at all. It's really so you can understand what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong. And it really helps you to find your competitive edge. Also, if you've got competitors um, that are already selling into stockists, then that is the start of potential stockists for you to approach when you're ready to do that. So it helps you build that target customer list. And never be scared of competitors. Um, 
if your competition are doing well, that just indicates that there is demand for your type of product or service. So it's a good thing. It's actually much harder to have something new or develop a new product category because then you've actually got to convince the buyers um, that there is going to be demand for it. So they always say it's always better to be the second, not the first at doing something. So in order for you to um, <clears throat> understand the competition and understand uh, the business uh, of the buyer you're going to be approaching, uh, you need to do some what we call comparative shopping. And you want to build a picture of what that brand um, and products that are present in the, in, the, uh, in the retail outlet and how the buyer is buying. So you want to know what product, product categories they're stocking, uh, the price points, the depth of stock that they carry and the sizes that they offer. And if it's a retail sort of physical stockist, uh, what kind of packaging or point of sale material um, is accompanying the brand. So these are really important things to understand. A lot of uh, brands spend a lot of time and energy and money trying to approach buyers that are never going to buy their product. And it's not because their product isn't good, it's just not right for that particular retail outlet, uh, and it never will be. So if you do this comparative shopping, hopefully you'll be able to sort that, that out. So you've got to research the retailers. Now you can do an awful lot online, and that's, that's the bonus, but it's always good to actually get out there and physically visit stores and talk to the people working in the store um, see how things are being displayed uh, because a, a physical retailer will be thinking of how they merchandise the product um, and how it works with everything else they're buying. An online retailer, it's slightly different the way they're going to present things. If um, it's a large chain and there's lots of branches, you need to research the portfolio and have a good idea of um, which branches you think your products would work in because it may be that they wouldn't work everywhere and some of the large department stores have their kind of prime stores um, that, that would carry maybe better product than maybe some of their regional stores in smaller towns. So if you're asked that, you want to know and the buyer wants to know that you've looked into this, that you do know which of the stores you think your product would work well in. And you can always use market research reports as well for some of this information. Uh, the British Library has great reports you can access for free um, and you can really sort of delve deep into the retailers. So that's what you've got to do. And we, uh, when we're working with brands, we always provide them with this template that they sort of, you can amend, whatever, but they will go away. And if you sort of capture everything in, and I think in lists and things, it, it makes it much easier so you'll see on the left hand side, we've got the sort of things we want to know about that retailer. And then at the bottom, how our products will compare to some of the key competitors that they are stocking. And also um, sort of space to kind of capture the name of the buyer and their contact details. Um, so this is a, a useful kind of tool for people to take forward. The other thing you need to be aware of is um, when are the buyers buying? Now, most buyers work to um, a certain buying calendar. They're not just buying all the time, unless they're kind of like a, a sort of a fast fashion retail store that is buying from wholesalers from stock. And then, yes, those guys are buying literally all the time. But particularly for the middle to better end of the market, you'll find that retailers set aside some budget to spend um, in advance so that they can plan themselves properly and then they keep back some of that budget so that they can repeat order or buy more stock to top up within season. So therefore you've got to make sure your range of products is ready to show the buyers at the point they're spending their money. And this very much depends on what your business is um, and what product you're offering. But as, as an example, if you're looking at the women's wear buying calendar, most brands offer four collections um, and the pre-collections um, tend to be the more commercial collections but in fact the buyers spend more money on those pre-collections than on the main line so it's a bit odd but one growing sector is this cruise and resort uh, pre-collection and the selling period for that is sort of usually around June time 
and delivery in the stores will be kind of October to December. Then you've got your spring summer main line that will be selling around September, October time, and that would normally go into the store sort of end January through to March. Then you've got your pre-fall early autumn collection. Um, again, the selling period is kind of December, January um, for kind of May, June delivery into the stores, and then the autumn winter main line, um, which you're normally selling February, March time, and that goes into the store July to September. Now, this is looking at women's wear and this is looking at the northern hemisphere. Men's wear tends to be a bit earlier, so their mainline collections are normally sold more or less at the time of the pre collections of the women's. And you know, there'll be differences for lingerie, for swimwear, etc. But the best thing to do is look at when the trade shows are going on and when the fashion weeks are, and that will give you an indication of when uh, the buyers are buying. So yeah, because you might need to work that into your, your scheduling. You then, um, hopefully, you've got to get a sales appointment. You've got to actually get to see that buyer. And that is one of the biggest challenges, um, let alone them liking what you've got. So firstly, while you're doing your sort of research, um, you can start to draw up a list of your target shops to approach. And hopefully, you've verified that they are the sort of retail outlets that would buy your product. And it's very important to find the relevant name of the buyer because generic placeholder emails or contacts won't really find their way to the buyer. So that can be a bit difficult. Um, that's why it can be good to physically go into stores because uh, you can get chatty and find out the name of the buyer. But there are some online resources that are helpful. LinkedIn can be good. Uh, reading some of the trade press like Drapers or Business of Fashion or Fashion United can be useful because you'll invariably find lots of articles where buyers are being quoted and then you can just make a note of the name of that buyer and, and try and sort of look at the general email address and kind of cobble together what you might think might be their email. And you'll find making appointments with independents will be much easier than reaching out to chains or department stores or the big online multi-brand players because they've got gatekeepers. So with some of the uh, retailers like Arcadia, I mean, if you ring up, they won't even acknowledge that the buyer exists. It's like MI5, really. So you have to be a bit like a detective, really. So I always say if you can start with the independence, it'll be easier. And then once you've got a bit more confident, sort of move on to the department stores um, as a starting point anyway. Um, there is no easy way of getting these appointments with buyers. Um, it's going to be a combination of sending information by email, um, following up with a phone call, uh, even posting things out to them. In fact, you could say that because we don't use the post much these days, they might actually notice something in the post. But if you are kind of calling, emailing, it might be helpful to prepare a framework or kind of a script in advance that you can follow. And one thing that is um, important is that if you're sending out emails or letters, make sure you personalize them. Make sure you mention something about the actual uh, retailing themselves so that it doesn't look like a, just a gen generic bulk email that's been sent to everybody because that really looks quite lazy um, and they're more likely to notice something if you have said something about them and how you admire the store and you like this brand that brand that they stock and you really think your product would fit in well. You also need to be really really persistent. Um, the one email is not going to do the truck nine, nine times out of ten you're going to be uh, ignored so you have to keep emailing season after season, following up, until they basically tell you not to bother. <laughs> so just keep going. Um, if you are going out and about, visiting retailers can be good. Um, I used to always go in on a Monday morning when it was really quiet, everybody's bored, um, just to have a chat. And then I would maybe have a couple of samples in a bag in case I got chatting to the buyer or to the shop manager. And I could always say, you know, if you've got a couple of minutes, could I show you a couple of pieces? Um, but really just, just using it as an opportunity to get information, find out who the buyer is, and then it could turn into a bit of a sales appointment. Um, it's always worthwhile doing, and you might try to start doing that in people not too far from you, and then kind of have a wider reach with independence going further afield. And if you are doing a lot of this work, make sure you're capturing it so you know which retailers that you've contacted, when you contacted them, what the response was and any actions needed, uh, because otherwise it can get a little bit overwhelming. 
And the other thing to do is think about perhaps try to approach a retailer not to get sale necessary but just to get their feedback and doing it before they start buying for the season so you kind of get in there early and that puts less pressure on them really because actually you're really asking them for more guidance and feedback than actually a sale so hopefully you've got your appointments um now's the time that you have to prepare your pitch um and that can be a little bit daunting particularly if you're not confident, but it's a question of practice makes perfect and being prepared. So prepare yourself, think about what you've got to do before you go to the appointment. So make sure that any products are shown to the best. Um, if you're visiting a buyer at their premises, um, make sure you've taken some nice hangers to put the products on if it's hanging product. Um, if it comes as particular packaging, um, if it's millinery, if you've got hat boxes or jewellery pouches or shoe bags, make sure you take a sample of that so the buyer knows what comes with, with the order. Um, and when you prepare your pitch, practice. Practice in front of friends, in front of family, in front of the mirror. But the more you practice, the more confident you'll feel and that you'll come across. It's always very helpful as well. Um, to start preparing questions to ask them, um, because actually what you want is to get a two-way conversation going and get feedback. So if you can pre-prep questions to ask them, which don't have yes or no answers, um, things about their business, about what's working, what isn't, then that kind of helps break the ice a little bit. And on the other side of that, think about what they might ask you, what they're gonna want to know from you as a buyer and prepare answers to those questions so that you, sort of show yourself to be kind of very professional and very in control. So when we talk about a pitch, um, often people say you should think of it as a triangle because the uh, instinct is to go into a sales meeting and just keep sort of talking, talking, rambling on and then not letting the buyer have any time to talk or to listen to what they've got to say. So really you should be talking the minimum amounts at the top of the scale and it's actually the buyer that you want to be engaging with. Um, so you want to listen to them and, and, and encourage that conversation. And there's essentially around six stages um, to a sales pitch. Now, the first stage is you introducing who you are, um, the name of the brand and what you do within the organisation. That might seem very obvious, but I can't tell you how many times people go into sales meetings and forget to introduce themselves. And I mean, I've done it myself. Um, and actually their role in the business, um, because actually you can be quite nervous and you just forget to say it. You then will sort of tell them what you're presenting, so it might be a particular season collection of and what your products are, and then you've got to get your killer USP strap line in there, um, so that you immediately get a sense of what the brand is. You will then probably have your samples with you, so you will be talking them through your range of products. And while you're showing your products to them, you want to be highlighting the key benefits of those products and why it will be good for that particular retailer to stock this brand, what it's going to bring them and how it's going to serve their customers' needs and appeal to their customers. Um, and then, as I said, you want to have those prepared questions ready so you can start asking the questions um, and getting this two-way conversation going and sort of handle any any questions they've got about the brand um, or any queries they've got. So hopefully you can have this conversation. And then finally, you're kind of dealing with all their questions. But when a, a meeting ends, you don't want it sort of to end without a clear next stage to this. Um, now, if they haven't liked what you want, it might be, look, thank you very much for showing us, but it's not right for us. And then Actually, I would always want to know why that is, um, because then I you know, might be feedback to take on board for, for another time. But it might be that they have selected some styles that they want from you, but they haven't confirmed the quantities. That often happens. So then it might be that you agree at a certain time after a day or a week or whatever it is, that you're going to be contacting them for the quantities. Or they might have asked some information from you that you haven't got the answer to. And the next thing is that you'll get back to them to deal with the queries that you didn't have answers to. But yeah, always make sure that you close agreeing what the next step is one way or another. 
So before you go to that appointment, um, it's easy to forget things. Uh, create a list for yourself. Uh, this is a list of some of the things. And make sure all your samples are clearly identified so that nobody gets confused you know, referring to the wrong idea or the wrong product. You'll take any of your marketing materials and line sheets. Um, doubtful you'll have all your products made in all the available colours and prints, etc. So make sure you've got your alternative swatches with you. Any press that you've got, you can take a collage of, of any of that. And make sure you've uh, prepped up with any key information in terms of minimum order, delivery times, all that kind of thing as well. Um, trading terms might be a subject of discussion. Now, if it's an independent and they're a new um, new brand or a new retailer, well, ideally what you want to do is, is take a deposit from them when they confirm an order and then the balance would be available um, when the goods are ready for shipping. But if you're selling to a big retailer or one of the sort of real premium retailers everybody's trying to sell to, they're more likely going to be dictating their trading terms to you. So you really want to find out what those are in advance so that you you know that to work that into your price points. Um, another thing, your ethical and sustainable policy um, is going to be important to the buyer, even if you are not a so-called sustainable brand. So they will expect to have um, policies from you, particularly if it's a big retailer. And if it is a big retailer, they will also want to know you're working with suppliers that have been audited. Um, so an audit is, there's a couple of uh, bodies that conduct uh, factory audits to make sure they are compliant to um, health and safety and ethical trading standards. But that's an expensive thing for a factory to have done. So if you're working with small manufacturers, it, they're likely not to be audited. And it may be that actually it's going to be difficult to sell to large retailers. Uh, but also things, any service that you can offer if you're able to repeat orders, um, so if the buyer gets a good reaction, they can then place another order. That's something very important to tell them. And it also may be that you have a deadline to get your order from them because you need time to go into production uh, and manufacture the products. So they need to be made aware of what that is. But anyway, this will change depending on what you're doing. But have a little sort of tick list for yourself so that you can just refer to it before you go to that import appointment. So just finally, sort of to wrap up. Um, just remember, buyers are inundated uh, from new brands wanting to sell to them. And uh, if they're already selling well um, from brands, it's a bit of a risk to move away from a brand they know can, they can sell well to a new one. So there has to be a really strong proposition for them. And many times they were, as I said, like with the trade shows, um, even if you go to an appointment with them, they may buy, but it may not be the first or second time that you show them the product because they want to see you consistently come up with good product. Because one thing buyers don't like doing is chopping and changing their suppliers. So they like to know that, yep, you've really got a good design team um, or your designs are consistently kind of fresh and, and, and in line with what they want to stock. Um, as I said, at the very, very beginning, you need that clear USP. Um, and to be able to really tell them why they should buy your product. Consistency is very important. So as I keep saying, you have to be thick skinned, you have to be persistent until they tell you to stop doing so. And even if they don't buy from you, just try and get that feedback because if you saw several buyers and they all were giving you the same feedback, that may mean that you have to reevaluate what you're offering. Um, so it's always really helpful. And essentially, there is no one size that fits all. Every buyer is going to be different. Every organization is going to be different. And how you deal with them will be different. But all I can say is the more you do it, the easier it does get. Um, and just if you're convinced you have got a good product, just keep going. You'll get there in the end. So just quickly before I hand back over to Bailey to manage the questions uh, anyone might have, we've got the next events coming up. If anyone looking for um, growth funding, uh, we've got a talk on the 10th of January called Pitching for Fashion Funding. Um, our Selling Fashion Online one is on 7th of February. That looks at all the different online uh, selling channels. Um, our Sourcing Production Management Getting It Made workshop is 6th of March, and there's also a sort of a, an ongoing getting it made online course as well. 
So thank you very much for listening to me, everyone. I hope that was helpful. And I will hand over to Bay now. Yeah, thank you, Alison. The, um, the information and the key points that you gave were obviously very valuable for the cohort specifically. And um, we've got a few questions that have come through. Um, I'm going to ask you two of them. Um, the first one is, um, are there any key trends that you think buyers are looking for in 2019? Well, for 2019, um, a lot of the buyers would have already have, have got their stock um, ordered uh, coming into spring, summer, and they'll be looking to buy the kind of autumn, winter, sort of February, March time. But I think buyers now um, are really looking for products that have a long shelf life. And it obviously depends on the buyers and what end they are of the market. But um, with this whole move towards sort of investment and slow fashion, um, they're really looking that yeah, the pieces are, are going to be uh, offer value even at the high end of the market. And I think sustainability and, and transparency in the sourcing and is becoming more and more important as well. So yeah, I think I think everyone's got to look at their supply chain. And, and see, you know, how transparent that can be made um, for the buyers. Amazing. Um, and uh, just the last question, I think um, this one is quite, it will obviously depend on the buyer as well, but um, what flexibility uh, do I need to have in terms of moving prices when meeting with a buyer? I think um, you need to know what your bottom line is. Um, and I think most people know some of the margins that everyone works to, but the retailer will be very clear what they want to sell your product for. And if anyone's going to take a hit on the margin, it's going to be you, and you'd have to make that strategic decision. Um, but what you need to sort of know is what the parameters are. So if, if you can get cheaper prices from your supplier, providing you get an order for say 100 pieces or something, then, you could say to the buyer, you know, I can discount um, if you would place an order for this amount, we can offer a better price, et cetera, et cetera. So, so go into a meeting, know what those kind of parameters are and at what point you can offer discounts. As I said, um, if it's a big retailer, they often take settlement discounts. It might take 30 or 60 days to pay and then take a discount on top of that. So you need to go into that meeting knowing what that is because that is also going to reflect on your price points really um, but you shouldn't be pushed into doing anything that you're not comfortable with if you're not sure you can always say that you'd have you know you'll have to get back to them and you can go away and think about it yeah I think that's one of the key things as well is if you're unsure don't obviously say yes to things that you don't want to do because it is your business um, but is. Yeah, thank you thank you so much um, Alison for taking the time to do this um, any questions that anybody has please feel free to um, email me and we can do our best to answer those um but yeah have a lovely christmas everybody and um a happy new year and